Hello learners welcome to critical classicism lecture 6 today we'll talk about the topic criticism as dialogue theory of tragedy is all clear to you which we discussed in the last lecture now today we shall talk about dialogue in prolix now first to understand what is a dialogue it is a classical yana and was primarily a philosophical and investigative tool but it was an art form as well it was instrumental in delineation of a hypothesis and was employed by characters to emphasize the opinion raised now you see what is a hypothesis you need to understand the difference between uh, science and humanities first science normally moves from concrete to abstract we have you know some concept then we move on to you know so it's a movement from concrete to the abstract while in humanities we have uh, it's the other way round we have from the abstract we move towards the concrete people may not accept an idea today but whatever a hypothesis is laid down today whatever idea is laid you know it goes a long way many ideas exist as long as the human civilization is there on the globe for example you have milton's theme of paradise lost world may might be destroyed with nuclear wars but as and when creation again happens on the surface of earth or any other planet themes raised by milton would forever be discussed by mankind so we normally lay a hypothesis and then the opinions are raised we have some idea we float that idea and then there are opinions being raised there are questions raised and then there are probable answers to those questions and then they are analyzed it's not like science you know that you start questioning you need to accept whatever is there you know, we we cannot deny that so dialogue however was interrelated with other forms of public speech we know the importance of dialogue you might have seen the honorable prime minister or many other politicians while making public speeches they ask the question is it or not so that's how you know and then public responds though there are some ingenuine people there and there are genuine people also who respond to the questions being raised by the politician on the stage or a military commander you know while he talks to his subordinates or soldiers so it was a form of oratory and rhetoric employed in various forums of greek society such as the courts political gatherings and theater so you find ample use of this art in courts you know in modern courts modern courts are no exception you look at the courts there are arguments there are counter arguments and in political gatherings you look at the parliament how people debate and in theater you know dialogue assumes a major importance in human communication now let's talk about the beginnings of dialogue beginnings of dialogue can be seen in the works of herodotus in herodotus we find dialogues between solon and croesus in his works then thucydides melia dialogue in the writings of thucydides it may be noted that these dialogues are not uninfluenced by the theatrical dialogues you know we learn through imitation people watch movie movies influence culture your tv serials so that's another story that this is a soft approach you know for cultural reasons marketing reasons uh, but you can't deny the importance you know of uh, the theater in uh, having impact on the audience so my most that's art of gesticulation imitating without the use of words we already discussed in our previous lecture the importance of kinesics the language through body movements it was instrumental in the evolvement of the philosophical dialogue and this is how we have the evolution of philosophical dialogue and it was prevalent till 4th century ad now early examples of this art are found in decile cry the masked man of sparta 
the auto capdali the improvisers of central greece and the fleeks of italian reason performance of mime would be witnessed in weddings banquets and marketplaces mimos was a hybridization of dance mimicry song dialogue and storytelling and were performed by acrobats and jugglers xenophon an orator from plato's symposium mentions of mime that narrates the story of dionysus and adrian now sophron of sicarus we are talking about 5th century mime writers so we have sophron of sicarus he composed pieces meant for men and for women in dorian rhythmic prose it was quite close to the popular language and used classical criticism proverbs some of sophron's mimes are the women quakes the old fisherman and the women visitors to isthmia this indicates that mime dealt with the lower rungs of society and was comic in nature his tradition however could not be continued now very important line here is that uh, mime relates to the lower rungs of society you might have noticed public figures for example the prime minister the military commanders or the honorable judges of the supreme court or high court that there is no scope for comedy therein comic by aristotle and plato they've been assigned a much lower place in dramatic art than tragedy because tragedy teaches us tragedy teaches us not to be a tragic figure tragedy teaches us to make the right kind of choice so that we can avoid the tragic circumstances but nowadays we are noticing that comedy is overpowering everything so much so that even in wedding ceremonies which are which is a sacrament by all cultures and religions so it has been turned into a mockery you see how brides these days enter a wedding scene so there's an important point that we need to learn and you might have noticed that even in state craft people have no scope for comedy because running the state is a sacred serious sacred and serious business accordingly we find you know that running the family institution or any gathering it's again a serious this thing so it's not that comedy doesn't have an important place in our existence it does have but overdue emphasis to it can only, would only lead to uh, disasters now by by 3rd century we have use of words by mime writers herodas introduced dialogue in iambic variety his major works reflecting this innovation are the board the pimp the school master the women worshipers the jealous mistress in the dream unlike tragedy which was performed twice an year mimetic shows could continue throughout the year mime writers were always in touch with the poets of high standing decline in serious and high quality drama led to the invasion of vulgarity and obscenity in theater it led to emergence of new terms and this is history repeats itself this is what we are noticing in 3rd century bc the same thing could be noticed in the year 1742 when performance of dramatic arts was banned within the municipality limits of london because they were catering to the vulgar taste of the audience so we find this degeneration you know after a certain it's a cycle you know uh, that moves on so here in also we find this degeneration so then we have pygmia and hypothesis and their performances were termed as magodoi and mimalogoi sheritian escaped from the clutches of a south indian king who spoke pseudo indian claimed as tulu by ancients but is a precursor to the kannad language mime enjoyed immense popularity in the roman world but it came in conflict with the christian church because of its decadence we talked about the banning of theater within municipality limits of london so in the roman world also we find 
that it came in conflict with church because there's hardly any uh, space available for comedy in religious institutions as well. Since action was not so important in Amai, the focus shifted on dialogue. Though the dialogue was in a sung form, yet it led to an argumentative style. It led to juxtaposition of opposing views and opened up new vistas for criticism. Dialogue, therefore, was not a reproduction as such. Preservation of main ideas rather than a reproduction was the main goal in general discourses. Then we have digressions and dialogue. Digressions form an important part of art. You might notice it from your witnessing of uh, watching of Mahabharata and Ramayana. So you again Homer's Odyssey and Iliad. So there are digressions. The plot is moving in a straight direction. All of a sudden you find the poet taking a different turn. And there's a sub-episode kind of a thing. So that is done, then the story comes back to the main point and then it moves forward. So digressions formed an important part of a dialogue. It was done in order to maintain interest. Themes had to be of an enduring nature. Primary purpose of dialogue was criticism. Lamentation, bewailing and satirizing was the main purpose. Unlike today's world, wherein pluralism and relativist approach occupies a prominent space, Greeks laid emphasis on strict adherence to existing norms of conduct. Dialogue, therefore, was used as a means of social censor. Greek civilization is the parent civilization for the entire Christendom, and this period is interestingly termed as classical period of the Western civilization. And whatever names you hear in present-day discourse like Olympics, police, this and that, so all of them have their origin in Greece. So it was a classical civilization and interestingly it laid, uh, it did not approve of comedy much because it catered to the lower taste. Then we have Socrates, dialogue was never meant as a leisurely exercise to while away time. Even philosophers and scholars like Plato and Aristotle were con under constant scrutiny, sometimes culminating in public wrath. So it's not that Socrates and Plato they escaped public opinion. No, even they came under public wrath. The composers of Socratic dialogues are Plato, Xenophon, and as Chinese. Discussions with his disciples and admirers. Now, we have a very important uh, example as far as dialogue is concerned. All of you must be acquainted with Pythagoras' theorem. Uh, till your class 10th, you might have come across this theorem. There are many who do not have mathematical temperament, so they must have had a really hard time dealing with it. But let me tell you, Socrates, through his question and answering method, quote, make a shepherd boy understand this Pythagoras theory. He asks him, if this, then what? And he answers, and then he filters those answers with more questions and he says in this situation what and this is how you might be noticing that whenever classroom teaching goes on when you are promoted to a new class the teacher always comes and starts discussing something of the last lessons that you have read in your previous class so that there is a linkage between learning so question and answer method dialogue forms an important part in every sphere so we have platonic dialogues in all these are 25 in number wide variety of style and approach is there changes in philosophical approach can be seen his dialogues such as charmides hippias minor leches and crito talk about the personality and ideas of socrates wherein we find that socrates is shown to be an ugly man with a brilliant brain is of a jovial nature who enjoyed life was erotic good humored and had great physical endurance with austere habits. So it's through the dialogues that we have the delineation, the character of Socrates. Purpose of dialogue was to speak happiness through real language for individual as well as society. There was emphasis on true form or essence. His method was to suggest answers first, showing that each answer has come closer to truth, then inviting the answers of others and finally contradicting those answers became a perfect model for a dramatic device 
which was later on used in drama and other forms of art. So we had the legacy of Socrates, the question and answering method that became an integral part of dramatic performances or dramatic art. It led to the rise of humor and irony at later stages and the process is still being continued even to the present day art forms. Then we have dialogues in the middle and the last period. The investigative stance is subdued as reflected in the symposium. Federal and public, Republic in favor of an expository mode. You need to understand what is an expository mode. When we talk about Plato, Plato moves, you know, is much more scientific. He hits the nail on the head. Whereas when we talk about Aristotle, Aristotle elaborates in a very cool way. He opens up so many options and then he tries to uh, make his point of view. And yes, uh, he appeals, he obviously appeals to the readers more than Plato because Plato had the habit of summarizing. He was, uh, he spoke in a very condensed style. So the investigative stand is subdued as reflected in Symposium, Federal and Republic in favor of an expository mode. Dialogue is greatly reduced by the time we reach Parnimides, Timaeus and the Sophists. Dramatic suspense and conflicting views seem to have been done away with. Philosophers at this stage was not a person full of doubts, inquiry or seeker, but the one who had attained wisdom. So that was the definition of a philosopher during this time, a man who had already attained the wisdom. Now, Greek method and European style. Let's try to understand the difference between the two. Ambience of truth emerging from conversation, investigation, involvement of a group or a people. The final word usually came out from the prominent man like Socrates. We find, you know, that it's the prominent man who had his sway over things, he used to pass on the judgment that is the that was the Greek style of reaching a conclusion. Subject of dialogue was also not clear, but it emerged through discussion. So they didn't have Greeks did not have a subject of discussion. The discussion started you know on general things and then it moved on to specific domains. European tradition is different because we have a clear cut laying out of the subject matter and there are views and counter views. There's a synthesis, there's a thesis, there's antithesis and then finally we have synthesis. Beginning with theology, it has come out with a galaxy of subjects, especially during the Renaissance. Instead of Greek dialogues, Europeans followed oratory. Oration was supposed to be divided into parts of speech such as introduction, narrative, statement, proof and epilogue. So European essays such as Hegel, Sidney, Milton and Bacon used reason to defend their thesis. It may be noted here that they borrowed much from the Greeks in this context. So that's why we term European uh, civilization uh, or the Christian civilization uh, 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 as a uh, 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 copy of uh, the Greeks because the uh, Greeks laid the foundation of the Christian society. The short crisp conversation of Plato was overshadowed by Aristotle who focused more on expository style. So dialogue became extinct for two centuries until it was revived by Plutarch and Lucianus. The Plutarch he lacks the platonic depth, but gives an honest account of the life during his time. His the Solaria animalim is an argument on whether water animals are more intelligent than land animals. Other books are modeled on learned table talk. The Genio Socrates mixes history with the analysis of oracular powers. Armatorius talks about eroticism. Some of his other works are Pythian Dialogues, Apu Delphos, De Feye Oracules, Diamonis, and Defectu Oracular. Lucianos. Lucianos was born around 120 AD in Starnosta and he passed away around 180 AD. He produced about 80 dialogues. He was an avid traveler and a lecturer by profession. His dialogues are satiric and full of humor. He ridicules human vanity, philosophical pretensions and religious ideas. So we find that even 
In the age of Lucianos, we find that religion comes under scanner. So there is questioning. People have that spirit of questioning and questions are followed by answers. And when there is a question and answer process, that is again, you know, the debate takes place. Uh, so dialogue takes place. So his later works are influenced by Plato. In the Latin tradition, Cesaro comes closer to the expository modes of Aristotle than the compressed form of Plato. Now we have Sophists, that's a very different class. It was a class of teachers that moved from place to place. It's difficult to say whether there were any formal schools where they taught, but yes, one thing is certain about the existence and that is that they taught while moving from one place to the other and the teachings concerned with orating skills, the teachings concerned with philosophy and rhetoric and they used to impart education to the rich, to the royal class, royal class children because they had to be political leaders and political leadership without good lecturate ability is useless and then they also had to be at the seat of judiciary normally people at these positions came from upper echelons of society so even their arguments dialogues oratory was important so there were professional teachers who taught the children of the rich and moved from one city to another major teachings included imparting persuasive art speech training for political assemblies, public gatherings and courts of law, some of whom were also philosophers, promoted the preservation of the art of dialogue and rhetoric as part of the educational skills they imparted to their students. Then over the period of time, we find, you know, that things were degenerating, like we have in the present day world, wherein emphasis, we have a lot of emphasis on individualism, so much so that everything else becomes secondary. But that had never been the case with classical civilizations. So they were accountable, they were responsible to family, city and the state. So over the period of time, it was reduced to meaningless debates and was confined to literary exercises in the Roman period and declined after the second century because of Christian censorship. And we find Christian censorship coming in between to stop it. You may recall your readings of English drama. We find that in the year 1742, theatrical performances within the municipality limits of London were banned because theatre catered to the vulgar tastes of the masses. So now we find uh, Christians, uh, these uh, uh, religious people, intervening in these and there was censorship and uh, one of the major reasons cited is that it was associated with pagan religion. Then we have analytical tools, there were investigative method, there were clear conclusions drawn after a lot of analysis. It existed in ancient times and it was a conducive form of theatre in democracy. We have Socrates period. Now hypothesis became a dangerous thing over the period of time because it got associated with tyrannies and imperialism. Suppose uh, there's a dictator, let's talk about Pakistan, there was a, it has a history of military coups. So General Musharraf put Nawaz Sharif aside and assumed all powers and there's an executive order and later on everything falls in line and when the questions were raised about it, he justifies it. So that's one of the problems with the hypothesis. It, uh, uh, it, is, it becomes a useful tool in the hands of tyrannies and imperialism. In imperialism, you can understand that the uh, Europeans, they came out with, with the theory that it was white man's burden. That means to set the blacks right and imperialism got justified because of that. Since political systems move in a cycle, evolution of these analytical tools became an integral part of human civilization. We find that these orders justifying military coups, so these hypotheses, they have become an integral part of human civilization.
because we find that there is democracy, then there is autocracy, then there is dictatorship. So political cycles, systems move in a cycle and these analytical tools, then they come to their aid. Then we have later European writings. So these can be found in Hamlet. We have the investigative model, Hamlet questions, so much so that he enacts a play within a play to catch the guilty conscience of his uncle who murdered his father to marry his mother. So we find that he uses question and answer method to conclude. He simply doesn't rely on the ghost of his father, which tells him you know, that it was his uncle who had killed his father. Then the enigma in the Poetry of Blake is also related to uh, that question and answer analysis. In Divine Comedy, Dante explains the order of the universe through the character of Betrays and lays emphasis on unquestioning faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. And the same thing is being reflected in the poetry of Pope and Wordsworth also, wherein uh, we find that Wordsworth questions Pope and Pope has his own agenda. So examples can also be found in many non-European countries as well as which witness the influence of Greeks. Now, we would like to conclude that even in 20th century, we find the reflections of Greek thought and tradition as dialogue assumes a major significance. The entire world has moved towards democracy and we know democracy has the government in power in the opposition and without a dialogue, it can't move forward. We cannot have better conclusions without a meaningful dialogue. Now, it is also evident in the three voices of poetry by T.S. Eliot, wherein the poet can be seen speaking to himself, addressing others, and as a dramatic persona, these are an expansion of the Greek tradition. So we find that Greek tradition uh, did not only influence the European civilization, but it has its effect can be seen all over the world, especially in the democratic societies. So we'll stop at this. I'm sure you must have understood uh, the emergence of dialogue and its uh, role in criticism, how dialogue and criticism are related. If there are any issues on your part or if you have any questions, so you can simply send your queries via mail and I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you.